send unto them only you. Rip and tear until it is done. In 2016, Doom returned with an experience that redefined the franchise for a modern era. The first new entry in the series since 2005 introduced the push-forward combat philosophy, bringing terror to the demonic hordes by having the player face them down with rage and aggression. Unlike anything else in contemporary shooters, it was the resolution of a long and difficult development cycle, but it clearly paid dividends as it struck a chord with audiences. In 2020, the franchise returned with Doom Eternal, a game that seeks to build atop the design pillars established but four years prior. And in this episode of Design Dive, we ask how this resurrected franchise could revolutionise the fight through hell on Earth. Doom Eternal is a game that, underneath all the ripping and tearing, is focused on iterating on its core principles, doubling down on many of the key elements of the previous game from 2016 and building upon that foundation to create something that feels new, fresh and equally groundbreaking. It's a further iteration in a process that started with the 2016 reboot in re-examining the core identity of what Doom is. As we'll discuss throughout this video, how Doom Eternal plays versus its predecessor is actually quite different, demanding much of the same skill set as the previous game, but now with a laser focus on specific aspects of spatial awareness and resource management. While I have spoken fondly of the game both in a previous Design Dive episode as well as in the main AI in game series, it's important to remember that Doom 2016 was less a divine resurrection and more of a salvage operation a game that languished in development hell originally as Doom 4, before the team on id Software's 2011 shooter Rage were brought on to help salvage it. The original Doom 4 was much more akin to contemporary shooters, earning the moniker Call of Doomy among some of the development team. One critical element saved from Doom 4 into the 2016 reboot was the Glory Kill, a mechanism whereby players can quickly and brutally eliminate an enemy whose health has been reduced to a particular threshold. From this concept comes the entirety of the game's core design, a philosophy known as push-forward combat. The game is built as counter-programming to contemporary shooters. Rather than going into cover, standing your ground or falling back, the idea is that you attack your enemy head-on. Glory kills have the added bonus of dropping health for the player when completed, and the chainsaw makes enemies drop ammunition. Both of these activities incentivize you to rush toward the enemy. It helps retain the focus and intensity of conflict as you play a game of combat chess in each encounter, finding good paths to carve through the space, prioritizing weapons based on the situation, and shutting down enemies quickly before they can realize their potential. The final touch is an acerbic wit that winks at the audience thanks to demonic invasions in progress and the Doomslayer's mute but grumpy warmonger personality. Doom Eternal takes all of these things on board and works to build atop it in a way that refines the core ideas of the 2016 game, whilst also introducing some of its own new mechanics. It's a game that pushes its core direction and identity in a marked direction, a relentless onslaught of chaos, a heavy metal album cover made hell fried flesh. Subtlety is not one of Doom Eternal's strong suits. It's all cranked up to a living and revels in its ridiculousness even when a lot of it doesn't make sense. But in amongst it all is a game that strives both to have players refine their skills in ways that will make you feel like a badass, but also bring you crashing down to earth again when it feels all too overwhelming. Doom Eternal's approach to combat is to strip as much fat off of Doom 2016. 
but it also makes some very pointed design decisions that force the player to play the game in a particular way, an aspect of the game that will merit much discussion later in this video. The mechanics are designed to be much leaner and ultimately drive the player to focus again on the three core pillars, getting yourself into a good position to take on a particular enemy, selecting the right weapon to eliminate that enemy, and then prioritising your next target so you can repeat the cycle once more. But of course, in amongst all of this, you're fighting off attacks from everything else. So when to get into position and stay ahead of the threat, you need to keep moving. The reboot was notable in how fast the Doom Slayer was. You could cover ground at a rate that far exceeds most contemporary shooters. With Doom Eternal, this has been enhanced further, with a greater focus on agility, with objects to swing from, and a dash that can be employed on ground or in the air. To close the distance at key moments, you can rely both on the glory kills and the chainsaw. The distance the player needs to be from the enemy to execute either of these is already broader than it was in Doom, and there's even a rune that you can unlock that extends the distance further. Plus, the meat hook attached to the super shotgun, effectively a grappling hook, can be used to bridge your agility between glory kills, meaning you can throw yourself into the air, grapple over to the target, and smash their skull in all as one smooth and continuous motion. Plus, many of the new mechanics are designed to address two critical parts of the combat puzzle, how to keep the player alive and how to deal maximum damage to enemies when the time and situation warrants it. As discussed, the glory kills have been reworked to be more aggressive, but this is further enhanced by both the Flame Belch and the Blood Punch. The Flame Belch is designed to pair alongside the glory kill by dropping armour instead of health, hence if the player has already largely maxed out health, or are confident they can gather up more health as they make their play, they can quickly scorch enemies with the Flame Belch and stack up their armour without having to seek out a dedicated pickup. Meanwhile, the Blood Punch is a shortcut for a shortcut removing the glory kill animation entirely and allowing you to smash down several enemies at once and grab the health drops. It's a booster that is given as a reward for using the glory kills correctly, given it can only charge from successful takedowns. Meanwhile, the weapon loadout has been refined to give each weapon purpose. The shotgun becomes the starting weapon, removing the pistol from the previous game, but within a couple of missions you will have the heavy cannon, the plasma rifle and the rocket launcher. These all have a clear purpose, be it to do high radial damage, hurt from afar, disable shields, or just blow some demon's head off. But then the mod system returns from Doom 2016 to take this one step further, giving each weapon a myriad of tactical purposes. While the starting shotgun is pretty weak, its mods give it value in new situations, turning it either into a grenade launcher or an auto cannon. And, as we'll see in a moment, the enemy AI is designed such that these mods begin to take on more value in specific combat situations. But from the very beginning, the ammo counter for each gun is incredibly low. Within minutes of killing your first enemies, you're introduced to the chainsaw and the value it provides in replenishing ammo. While it was more of a get out of jail card in the 2016 game, the chainsaw is a much more critical part of the core gameplay loop, given you will run out of ammo very quickly. In the opening menus of Doom Eternal, the following message is given as you start the campaign for the first time. You will need to master the use of your full arsenal. Each death has something to teach you about Doom Eternal's combat loop. Every new enemy type encourages you to use more of your kit. Never stop moving. In 2016, Doom's push-forward combat was designed to keep enemies out in the open, making them available to attack. Meanwhile, there was a limited number of enemies that could attack you at once, with the stun and stagger behaviours adding additional tactical opportunity, slowing one larger enemy down so you could clear the field. Make no mistake, these enemies would hunt you down and tear into you, but it's all predicated on neither side simply standing their ground, you push forward, they push back. In Doom Eternal, the demonic enemies push back even harder. The overall level of aggression is increased, the number of enemies that can attack you at once has been raised, and it's all too easy to push yourself back into a corner and be wiped out as a result. While there are a lot of familiar faces for Doom fans, much of the existing enemy archetypes have received a revamp, while new enemies address specific gameplay needs. Enemies from the previous game, such as the Hell Knight and Fireborn Barons, are faster and more ruthless. 
Plus, the Mancubus, which previously proved less potent up close, has an area of effect attack to keep you at distance. Meanwhile, each new enemy adds another layer of tactical consideration. The Gargoyles and Arachnotrons add more ranged combat, often staying at distance to fire projectiles. The Dread Knight adds to the existing pressure brought on by Hell Knights, but also forces you to be wary of their projectiles. The Whiplash also adds to the close range intensity, but it often sneaks up on you in ways that other aggressive archetypes will not. Plus, the Carcass not only puts pressure on your mobility and freedom of movement, but it also blocks attacks and forces hard strategic changes. This isn't an exhaustive list, nor need it be. It's sufficient to highlight how the game adds new layers of complexity to combat that influence tactics and strategy. There are four enemy classes in Doom Eternal. The Ambient, such as the Possessed and Unwilling, Standard Fodder, such as the Imps, Soldiers and Gargoyles, Heavies personified by the Arachnotron and Dread Knight, and the Super Heavy, such as the Baron of Hell, the Tyrant, and the Archvile. But for every major addition, there is also a weakness. All enemies will stumble or falter against specific weapon types. Meanwhile, the likes of the Mancubus and Arachnotron have weak points that can be eliminated. But those weak points are best tackled using specific weapons and mods, such as the Sticky Bomb and Precision Shot. This, combined with a limited amount of ammunition per weapon, encourages players to hot-swap between weapons more frequently. And while for most enemies you are encouraged to hot-swap to take them down faster, there are some for which it's practically essential if you have any hope of eliminating them. The newly minted Doom Hunter is a great example of this, a tank monstrosity that requires the player to take down their shields with the plasma rifle and damage their platform to eliminate their mobility and recharging capabilities. And then, of course, there's… no, you know what? I'm going to talk about him later. Every time a new enemy is added to the mix, it changes the mood and tempo of each fight. It influences whether you rush forward or hold back, what weapon you equip, whether you prioritise eliminating a specific heavy or clearing the field of the fodder to boost your health, armour and ammo. And when new enemies come in, one new opponent can be all it takes to change the tide of the battle. When we bring together the more aggressive and powerful enemies, the broader range of mechanics to move, to drive, to stagger, to falter, to smash, rip and tear, it highlights both Doom Eternal's greatest strength, but also its core fundamental weakness. It's a game that has so many individual systems at play that it requires the player to develop functional mastery of all of them with little to no remorse. The game guides players towards achieving mastery by introducing many of these mechanics gradually. The opening mission, Hell on Earth, is a much more stripped down version of Doom Eternal's ultimate mandate, with only the shotgun and heavy cannon as available weapons, plus the introduction of equipment such as the chainsaw, frag grenade and the ability to mod both weapons. In addition, the largest and most aggressive enemies are the Kako Demon and the Arachnotron, the latter of which is designed to teach the player to prioritise its mounted turret either via the shotgun sticky bomb or the heavy cannon scope mod. This is all of Eternal's core dynamics in a nutshell. You need to be always on the move. You need to select the right weapon for the current circumstance, know where that next dose of health or ammo is coming from and plan ahead for how the next few seconds of combat are actually going to play out, with each new enemy archetype having a big impact on that moment to moment gameplay. Do I swap to the rocket launcher to hit that Baron of Hell, disable that Arachnotron's turret, or clear the field of ambient AI to gather up armour, ammo and health? As the game unfolds, players are tasked with taking on more and more combat tools. The result is that by the closing acts of play, a strong Doom Eternal player will be constantly running a decision-making process in their head that considers which enemies are in the fight, where they are relative to you, and whether their weak points have yet to be exploited where the player is in the map and what tactical opportunities that provides, how much health and armour the player currently has, which of the primary weapons are available, the mods that are currently equipped and the ammunition count on each, whether the chainsaw has any available gas left in it or it's recharging back to one, ammunition available for top tier weapons such as the BFG 9000, the Unmaker and the Crucible Blade, the cooldown status of the Flame Belch, the Frag Grenade, the Ice Grenade and the Blood Punch and the cooldown of runes such as the Chrono Strike. 
As we've discussed already, all the tools provided help manage the ever-increasing, more aggressive and more complicated combat encounters players face, and when it all clicks together and the player is in control, it feels damn good to smash through each and every piece of shit demon that made the mistake of crossing your path. This is, for all intents and purposes, what we call a flow state, a psychological phenomenon that whereby you become immersed in your current activity. Your skill is matching the challenge presented, and it's a common design concept in games. We want players to grow and mature their skill set as the overall difficulty of the game increases. If the game doesn't keep up with your ever-increasing skill, you'll get bored. Designers would prefer that you feel like you're in control of the situation and ultimately enjoying the experience. Note that sometimes a game will deliberately prevent players from achieving a flow state. Horror games such as Alien Isolation deliberately keep the player outside of a flow state with the intent of driving up your anxiety and leading you to make mistakes. For any game to achieve a flow state, the player needs to keep up with the pace and challenge it presents and designers need to have a solid grasp of what skills a player could have attained by that point in the game, leading to a flow channel that exists throughout the game, balancing between boredom and anxiety. But often a struggling player can find workarounds and different solutions that allow you to survive difficult situations and right the ship as you move outside the flow channel. Sometimes you find an exploit that works in your favour, or a weapon that can get you out of difficult situations, but ultimately you want the game to continue to encourage players to refine their skills and learn how best to utilise the mechanics. And this brings us to what is effectively the crux of Doom Eternal's design and why it stands out from every other game in the series. It deliberately removes a lot of these opportunities for struggling players, and how it does that is pretty much everything we've heralded as the game's strongest elements. A player cannot rely on the weapon they're most comfortable with. The limited amount of ammunition and chainsaw fuel combined with weak points on enemies forces you to constantly swap weapons around. Enemies are designed to either force you to close the distance or keep your guard up. The mechanics have been refined down to a sharp edge, meaning you're either engrossed in the fight or you can't really enjoy the experience because you're too busy trying not just to keep yourself alive, but get back into the flow state. This is something that id Software are very much aware of. As we discussed already, they clearly state to you, each death has something to teach you. They expect players to die with the intention that you learn. You are being told that the list of acceptable ways you should play this game is incredibly small, and you need to get on the same page. It's sort of the equivalent of playing Devil May Cry, but if you score anything below an A rank, the game will just automatically kill you. This is evident right from the beginning of the game, with the melee attack no longer actually hurting or killing enemies. It merely stuns them. You have to shoot them to either kill them or bring them to a glory kill stun state before the melee attack has any potency. There are leaps of logic periodically in the mechanics of the game because it fits id Software's vision of how Doom Eternal should play. This isn't something they hide from. Rather, they've been quite overt about their design intentions from the beginning. In an interview on the Noclip podcast with Danny O'Dwyer, Doom Eternal's director Hugo Martin discusses how the flow state of the game, which he refers to as the fun zone, was explicitly made tighter to better facilitate the design ethos they had in mind and a driving force behind that was seeing people who played the 2016 Doom in a manner that did not reflect their vision for the game. When I looked at some of the footage, or like even that Polygon footage where it's like, Polygon can't oh, do. Yeah. The thing is, like, that's just a player playing the game. Mm. Like, who's, if that footage doesn't look great, whose fault is that? Is that their fault or our fault? Like, mm. how come that person was able to succeed playing that way? Like, with one gun, missing 80% of the time and the game should have killed that person, mm. you know, to to corral them into playing it the fun way, the right way. What we kind of noticed was that if you were a skilled FPS player and you picked up Doom 2016, you naturally fell into what we call at the studio like the fun zone, mm. where you're weapon switching and moving and glory killing and managing resources, you're doing all these good things and it feels good. Yeah. If you're not that good at FPS, you there were too many unplanned for exploits in the game right. like you could and and a couple of things where it's like hmm, if i master this and kind of just do this i could kind of beat the whole game with a sort of repetitive play pa style of play you know like for example like super shotgun mm -hmm. was kind of the solution to everything you know so we really went through and 
we we tried to shore that up to make it to hold the player accountable to not let them out of the fun zone you know the fun zone is managing resources it's doing all these different things it's thinking constantly it's using the right tool for the job it's diving into progression you know it's 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 uh what you'll see shooting weak points of enemies you know um all these different things and when they don't play that way we kill them Naturally, as a game creator, you wish for players to experience the game in a particular way, though it could be argued that Eternal's tighter focus could rob some players of their creative expression. As stated, when the game clicks in the hands of the player, it is immensely satisfying, and each new encounter can bring something fresh and exciting to the table. To the point that at the end of a fight you realise you've been holding your breath and tensing your body the entire time. There are many content creators and streamers out there who have achieved a high level of mastery in Doom Eternal, and it allows for these joyous, kinetic, frantic and simply immersive bouts of murder cinema. But conversely, it's also the source of much frustration in the hands of some players. You are nothing but a usurper, a false idol. My eyes have been open. Let me help you to see, Slayer. And while players may get frustrated by some of these elements, no part of the game personifies this better than the Marauder. The Marauder is arguably the super heavy rank enemy AI that you either love or hate. And it's important to raise this character at this point because the reason many players find him frustrating is because it's the culmination of everything we've just discussed. The Marauder is designed to be a counterweight to everything the Doomslayer can do. You can't rush him, you can't overwhelm him, you have to keep your distance, wait for an opening and do what little damage you can during those moments. This leans on the same ideas of the Mancubus area of effect attack or the Carcass Shields in trying to push back against the player's sense of momentum and control of the combat arena. Rather than stand and attack, the Marauder chases the player and expects you to maintain a certain distance without bumping into corners or geometry. Too close, he lets loose with a shotgun round. Too far away, his axe creates energy blades. But also, they carry a shield that cannot be destroyed. And the more damage it receives will result in him spawning a wolf that chases you as well, which is kinda metal. The one weakness is that the Marauder will attack you with his axe at medium range and during that wind up there is a small window of opportunity for the player to hit him, stun him and do a little extra damage. This is frustrating for players because it's so antithetical to the rest of the game. As we already discussed, if an enemy has a strength in Doom Eternal, there is a mechanism to weaken or remove it entirely. You are constantly attacking even when defending, but with the Marauder it's all about patience. Any attack you throw at him is auto-blocked if it's outside their stun window. The minigun, the chainsaw, heck even the BFG 9000. You can exploit splash damage from explosives to hurt him, but the game is really trying to get you to defeat him in a particular way. Stand your ground, wait for the opening, stun and follow up with more damage. In many ways, this is the epitome of id Software's approach to Doom Eternal, a tough as nails AI that forces the player to adopt a particular strategy. However, it can equally appear to be counter-programming. This is a game that educates the player that every problem can be solved by running towards it and shooting its face off. And if you're not solving it fast enough, you need to change to a different gun and shoot it harder. But the Marauder teaches you the opposite. The solution is to stand your ground and wait. As mentioned, they are the Slayer's counterweight, which can be jarring for players given the overt power fantasy that Doom Eternal provides. While Marauders are a force to be reckoned with one-on-one, -on -one, they are even more lethal during larger skirmishes. After your first interaction at the Ark Complex, the Marauders return on several occasions in the campaign as well as in the Slayer Gates, often in amongst an encounter with other demons. Here, your strategy is forced to change again given it's difficult to really apply pressure to them when there are several other demons in proximity. You have to know whether you can spare the time and space to get the hit on the Marauder or if the next few seconds are better spent taking out other large targets or simply clearing the field. It really changes the pace in a way that no other enemy in the game can do. Given the overall challenge and intensity, a recurring argument I saw cropping up online around the launch of Doom Eternal was that it's the Dark Souls of shooters, a game that requires such intense mechanical mastery that it would enable you to achieve anything it can possibly throw at you. 
But that's a thesis that not only highlights a lack of understanding of Doom Eternal, but Dark Souls as well. As detailed in my Design Dive episodes on Dark Souls 1 and 2, it's a series about patience and understanding, learning the best reward mechanisms to exploit and how you can capitalise on what is given to you. But it is also a game of tremendous mechanical depth. You can approach each Souls game with a variety of builds catering towards different playstyles, loading up on strength and stamina for a lumbering melee build, dexterity loadouts that encourage fast movement, dodging, rolling and striking with finesse, or leaning into faith and intelligence for a magic-based strategy. Or, you know, f*** it. Start with a pair of pants in your fists if that's how you like to spend your weekend. There are a lot of different ways you can approach Dark Souls, and Doom Eternal does not cater to that level of flexibility, nor the breathable space required in order to make it work. Yes, you can prioritise weapons and customise the runes you equip, but in truth the flow state of Dark Souls is much broader than Doom Eternal's. This isn't to say that one of these games is better than the other, nor does it mean Doom Eternal is a bad game. Rather, it highlights the intent of each developer. Doom Eternal is built to be played a certain way, and one which can really make the player feel the power of the Doom Slayer. But it is within tightly defined parameters, and deviating from the developer's intent can lead to failure and your ultimate doom. Doom Eternal pushed the franchise into new and uncharted territory crafting a tightly defined experience that leans on the legacy of the series, while pitting players in new, challenging and ferocious combat encounters. The ambition of the game cannot be understated, as it is far from a simple retread of the 2016 formula. It is a game that is mechanically rich, with the potential of each new weapon and encounter only emerging with repetition and dedication. But it's also a game that rewrites the combat chess rulebook and tears out some pages along the way. If you are willing to submit to this new playbook and play within the rules defined, then you get to enjoy what is arguably one of the most intense and exhilarating shooters of the past 10 years. As this design dive on Doom Eternal comes to a close, don't forget to catch my previous episodes on both the 2016 reboot, which is also an essay on the Doom franchise as a whole to that point, plus my video on the much maligned yet equally wonderful Doom 64. Over on the main AI and game series, I have detailed the inner workings and many interesting design features of both the 1993 original and the 2016 reboot. All this ripping and tearing through the hordes of hell has been supported by these awesome people on Patreon.